Buenos Dias World from the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. I'm Marco Wint. And I'm Rick Schwartz. And we're your hosts for season three of Amazing Wildlife, a show from iHeartRadio Ruby Studio and the global conservation organization behind the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Listen as we dive into the efforts here in San Diego and spotlight the heroes working worldwide to care for the species you know and love. Listen to Amazing Wildlife on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. How would you like a 15% discount to my daily email, the stack of stuff, the show notes, discounts to the conference, all of that? All you need to do is text the word SHOW to 33777. You'll get the annual subscription with a 15% discount to my daily email. You'll get the stack of stuff, the links to the show notes, discounts to the conference, and so much more. All you have to do is text the word SHOW, S-H-O-W, to 33777. Text SHOW to 33777. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour 3. Hello, America. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the United States of America. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Should you wish to be on the program, I, I got to go down a disturbing path with you at this moment. I'm going to play for you some audio. It is in Arabic. It is important that you hear it. This is a Islamic imam. One Jewish man in New York was talking to a businessman, Palestinian. Palestinian said... Honestly, I thought it was in Arabic because of the subtitles, but it's not. But he might be hard to understand because of his accent. So I will tell you what he's saying. One Jewish man. One Jewish man in New York 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 was... talking to a Palestinian businessman. First, the Palestinian said, don't worry, Jewish man. One day we'll come and we will slaughter you like a sheep and the stone and the tree will work undercover with us. They will tell us, hey, Muslim, come. Somebody is hiding here. Get up and kill him. O oh Allah, make us soldiers for you every way you want us to be with the tank, with the eye, with the money, with the hand. Make us soldiers for Islam. Make us die the way you want us to die. This is a sermon by Imam Abdul Zindani in Michigan on Friday. One day the Muslims will slaughter the Jews like sheep. O oh, Allah, make us soldiers for you. Make us die the way you want us to die. This is in Michigan. In a mosque in Michigan. Not the Middle East. In Michigan. On 96th Street and Columbus... In New York City, it's Effie's Cafe. Effie's Cafe is owned by Jews. It was vandalized. It was vandalized, claiming that uh, the people there support genocide. Red paint was thrown all over the building facade. Because, you know, uh, anti-Zionism always works out to be anti-Semitism. Now, here's a problem. You had Chuck Schumer last week call for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to step aside. Netanyahu was actually asked about this on uh, ABC over the weekend. Donna, there's a fallacy that is being perpetrated here. And you should take polls, you'll have your own polls, and check whether the people of Israel support the policies that I'm being criticized for. That is, supporting the policies of going into Rafah, destroying a quarter of the remaining Hamas terrorist army. That's like leaving a quarter of the the Nazi terrorist uh, army in uh, Germany and saying, no, we're not going to finish the last quarter, uh, and we're not going into Berlin. Most Israelis 
overwhelmingly support the position that we have to go in. They oppose the idea of ramming down uh, a two-state solution or a terrorist state uh, against uh, their will because they think that this is, will endanger Israel's uh, future. They support those policies that my, I'm putting forward. He's right. Chuck Schumer's actions to call on uh, the end of Netanyahu politically is because of the heckler's veto he's given people like this imam in Michigan who says one day the Muslims will rise up and kill the Jews even in this country. Soldiers for Allah against the Jews. The Democrats are willing to up in national security for political concerns. Now listen, I understand there are Democrats who could be listening right now and say Republicans would do it as well. Republicans would do it too. Except the Republicans are not in charge. The Democrats are in charge. They promised to be the adults that we needed. They promised not to put politics ahead of national security. And yet they're giving a heckler's veto to people who preach the death of the Jews. That's a real problem. Go back to what I mentioned in the first hour of the donors to Joe Biden. Roughly 93% of self-described or 93% of professors who give political donations gave to Joe Biden, not to Donald Trump. 93%. Many of them in Ivy League colleges have been turning a blind eye towards the rise of anti-Semitism on these college campuses. A lot of American Jews are Democrats, for a variety of reasons. Jewish populations overall tend to be more liberal socially. They tend to lean and be sympathetic to the Democratic side and Democratic arguments. It is Jewishness more an ethnic identity than a religious identity, the way, honestly, evangelical and Catholic have become. It's an identifier of, of shades of white, Catholic and evangelical. Jewishness is more of an ethnic mono, uh, moniker now than a religious moniker. People are thinking, well, what about Leviticus? What about what about the Old Testament? Why, why are why are they so liberal? Well, forget all that. They're ethnically they're Jewish and they tend to lean Democrat. And what we're seeing in this nation right now with these attack in New York, this this business in Michigan, what's happening on college campuses, is that the Democratic Party as a whole they don't distinguish. You can be an ethnic Jewish ally of progressivism. And you can be like Jonathan Glazer, the director who who uh, directed in the award-winning, Oscar-winning movie about the Holocaust who comes out and renounces his Jewishness because of the genocide in Gaza. It doesn't matter. If Jonathan Glazer went to Gaza right now, he'd be killed because he's Jewish. The, they don't care that he considers himself an ally. It's the same way that so many of the partisan progressive non-white left, when they call for white people to be their allies, they don't really care. They'll be as cruel to them. The things of the world hate the things of God. They will lash out. But you all need to be aware of what's happening in this country. There is a lot of data from European countries the like that when Muslim population increases over 10%, that's when the the calls for um, more demands to adherence to Sharia law and, and Islamic codes and, and things, that's when uh, that becomes an issue. It has in European countries. It has in portions of this country, Dearborn, Michigan, being a, a – Prime example of it in areas around there with large concentrations of of Muslim populations. Now they get elected to office, and they, to some degrees, as a social conservative, it, it, it makes you kind of happy. They, they've gotten rid of the rainbow flag on government buildings. They prioritize family structure. They prioritize family friendly laws. But there also this strain of anti semitism and hating the Jews that comes with it, and and persecution of Christians that come with it, and. The Democratic Party can't stand up to it because the Democratic Party worldview is colonizer versus colonized. And because Muslims are viewed as the colonized, they have the moral clout, they have the moral authority. This allows me, I guess, to be somewhat repetitive to each of you about the dangers of intersectionalism because intersectionalism comes from critical theory. It's derived from critical theory, which itself is Marxist in origin. And in Marxism, everything is about 
power and the distribution of power and the dynamics of power. Words are power. Words create reality. The sky is not blue because the sky is blue. The sky is blue because the majority of people say it's blue and have imposed on everyone that the sky is blue. But really, there are people who are colorblind who can't see the sky is blue. Therefore, because of their exception to the rule, the rule is invalid. And you cannot say the sky is blue because you say that in your privilege. That's critical theory. That's intersectionalism. And the world is divided based on colonizer and colonized, based on white heterosexual men who are Christians and everyone else is a class of the oppressed. And the oppressor, who is defined conveniently enough as the white male Christian conservative, can have no moral authority because he's an oppressor. Only the people oppressed have moral authority. And the less you are a white male Christian conservative heterosexual, the more authority you have. So if you're, instead of being white, you're black. Instead of being Christian, you're Muslim. Instead of being heterosexual, you're gay. Instead of being male, you're female. You have much more authority. You add in a a transgender amputee, and that person has the ultimate authority. Because they're the least like the the able-bodied white male Christian heterosexual conservative. And so the Muslim imam has moral authority under critical theory and intersectionalism to say we need to kill all the Jews and one day that day will come here in the United States. And the white guy behind the microphone on talk radio, he's a conservative evangelical Christian, has no moral authority to combat it according to the worldview of the progressive left. You can't call out the evil when the evil is from a woke class of people. So it doesn't matter if you're Jewish and an ally and say all the right things. They'd come for you, too, because you are considered of the oppressor class. And the Democrats are putting these people and their worldview in a prominent position to shape public policy. A lot of my liberal Jewish friends woke up on October 8th, 2023, stunned at the reaction of people they thought were their friends and on their side politically who said the Jews got what they deserved on October 7th. And they've remained shell-shocked ever since as they see Israel doing everything they can to contain the violence in Gaza, sparing as many people as possible, and yet being accused of genocide, being accused of perpetrating their own holocaust. People saying things that simply are obviously not true, and, and, and there's no care there. And the Biden administration is giving this heckler's veto to the people who want to end Israel's response to Hamas. They're giving the heckler's veto to a group of anti-Semites. They're giving the heckler's veto to imams in American mosques calling for death to the Jews. They're giving the heckler's veto to the Muslims of Dearborn, Michigan, who believe that Israel is a colonizing oppressor that should be eliminated. They're giving the heckler's veto to the progressive college students marching in the streets, chanting from river to sea an explicit call for genocide of the Jews and the elimination of the Jewish state. There, Chuck Schumer, the highest-ranking Jewish official in the United States, has given a heckler's veto to people who would want him dead because of his ethnicity and religion. Because he wants to stay in power. And he believes with them voting for him, he can stay in power. But a group of anti-Semites are not going to long want a Jewish leader in the Senate. They'll let him stay as long as it's convenient and dispatch him as quickly as they can. You give the hecklers a veto, they heckle more loudly. And at some point, that heckling becomes something else. And we're beginning to see it in places like New York, where a deli can be trashed and vandalized because the owners are Jewish. And if you're Jewish, you're presumed to support genocide 
by those who wield the heckler's veto, who have been emboldened by the Democratic Party. Buenos dias, world, from the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. I'm Marco Wint. And I'm Rick Schwartz. And we're your hosts for season three of Amazing Wildlife, a show from iHeartRadio Ruby Studio and the global conservation organization behind the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Listen as we dive into the efforts here in San Diego and spotlight the heroes working worldwide to care for the species you know and love. Listen to Amazing Wildlife on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Greetings. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The full number 877-973-7425 should you wish to be on the program. If you are a subscriber to my daily email, you would have seen this uh, link in the show notes and I, this is just cool. So the Colombian Navy found the final resting place of the Spanish galleon San Jose in 2015, uh, but its location was a state secret. The wreck and its cargo left in the Caribbean efforts to conserve the ship and recover its precious cargo has been caught up in a complicated string of international legal disputes between Colombia, Spain, Bolivian indigenous groups and a U.S. salvage company laying claim to the wreck and the gold, silver and emeralds on board said to be upwards of 17 billion with a B dollars. When Columbia tried to auction off part of the bounty to fund the colossal cost of recovering the ship, UNESCO and the country's highest courts intervened. But eight years after the discovery, officials now say they're pushing politics to one side and could begin lifting artifacts from the holy grail of shipwrecks as soon as April. There's been this persistent view of the galleon as a treasure trove. We want to turn the page on that. Alhina Cicado, director of the Columbian Institute for Anthropology and History, says, we're thinking about the treasure. We aren't thinking about the treasure. We're thinking about how to access the historical and archaeological information. So the San Jose was returning to Europe with treasures to help fund the War of Spanish Succession when it was sunk by the British in 1708 near Cartagena. Historians say the wreck could reveal a lot about the Spanish Empire at the height of its power, but also it's expected to have 17 billion with a B dollars worth of gold, silver, emeralds, and other things on board. Um, few ships like the San Jose have ever been recovered, and none have been salvaged from warm tropical waters. There's a huge challenge in saving a ship like this. The closest comparison could be the Mary Rose, the flagship of Henry VIII's fleet, which sank in 1545 in battle with the French. The 16th century wreckage was explored by hundreds of divers uh, for a decade before it was carefully lifted up in 1981. The sur surviving section of the ship's hull is now on display in a museum. Um, this is, it, it's, it's fascinating. The San Jose's cargo includes glass, porcelain, leather, gold, silver, emeralds, diamonds, uh, all 600 souls on board were lost, I, but they found it. It was a state secret. They've known it. They've revealed it, and now they're ready to pull it up. I'm just that. That's really cool as a history buff. That's really really cool. Now, what's really cool as well? If you're a small business or you ship regularly, you can go to stamps.com, click on the microphone, put in Eric, and start saving on your shipping today. With Stamps.com, you get a free digital scale, some free postage, a limited time offer to go to Stamps.com, click the mic, put in Eric, and you save. You can get access to UPS and post office shipping rates up to 89% discounts. You can arrange pickup at your home or your office for packages. I do this pretty regularly, y'all. I ship stuff to new stations and, and uh, different people, I, I, and I use Stamps.com. I have for years since I was a lawyer back in the early 2000s, left my law practice, needed a convenient shipping option, stamps.com. For 20 of their 25 years, I've been a customer on and off. You can cancel at any time and then come back to it later if you need it. Uh, there's no long-term offer or no long-term contract to sign, no contractual obligations, cancel at any time. But it saves you money on your shipping and, best of all, gets you out of standing in line when you arrange pickup at your home or office. It's stamps.com. You click on the microphone. You put in Eric, E-R-I-C-K, you'll get some free postage, a free digital scale, no long-term commitment, no contract to sign. You get shipping and saving today with Stamps.com. Buenos dias, world, from the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. I'm Marco Wint. And I'm Rick Schwartz. And we're your hosts for Season 3 of Amazing Wildlife, a show from iHeartRadio Ruby Studio and the global conservation organization behind the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. 
Listen as we dive into the efforts here in San Diego and spotlight the heroes working worldwide to care for the species you know and love. Listen to Amazing Wildlife on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hello there and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the Fruited Plain, the full number 877-973-7425. Two separate stories for you. This one posted this morning at 6 a.m. The other one posted yesterday morning at 9 a.m. on a Sunday. Let me start with the second one posted yesterday on a Sunday. This is from Bloomberg News. Headline. Grocery prices have soared. That's spoiling Biden's economic pitch. The surge in grocery prices since just before the COVID lockdown has been stunning, up more than 25%, a full five percentage points more than consumer prices overall. President Biden has tried channeling customers' ire toward food companies and grocery chains, accusing industry giants of abusing market power to raise profit margins at the expense of the customer. And he's tried commiserating, complaining about packaged food shrinkflation in the Super Bowl-timed Instagram video and again in a State of the Union address. But Americans, regular trips to the grocery store three times a week for the average U.S. household, while I am clearly above average, are a powerful driver of economic discontent, constantly reminding consumers the higher cost of feeding a family. The outsized increase of the cost of food is hurting support for Biden, especially among crucial Democratic constituencies such as minority groups. Low income and lower middle class families are squeezed hardest because they spend a large share of their income on food. Now, that was yesterday. This is today. From the Washington Post, the pro-Hamas supporting Washington Post. Given how pro-Hamas they are, I'm surprised their graphic is of a piggly wiggly in the giant pig. In Wisconsin, a vote for Biden or Trump could come down to grocery prices. Subtitle. The local Piggly Wiggly in Sheboygan is ground zero for economic discontent in an area with low employment and great job prospects. Don Moore stopped by the local Piggly Wiggly to pick up $6 worth of pork steaks last week and immediately remembered just how much she'd grown to hate grocery shopping. Everything so damn high, she said, shaking her head at $3.09 bottles of Coca-Cola. Good old Biden. Moore a 54-year-old home health care aide, mostly shops the clearance aisle. Her $17 hourly paycheck, which includes up to 80 cents, which inched up 80 cents in the past two years, is hardly enough to cover the basics anymore. She says there's no question she'll vote for Donald Trump again. Every trip to the supermarket cements her resolve. When Trump was president, there wasn't inflation. We could afford food, she said. The mood around the sodas past aisle nine at the Piggly Wiggly. I'm sorry. Being from the South, I must reread this paragraph. The mood around the Coca-Colas past aisle nine of the Piggly Wiggly is a stark reminder of what matters most to Americans this election season. In poll after poll after poll after poll, voters say inflation and grocery prices in particular is a leading concern. That's true in the Midwestern manufacturing town, overflowing with well-paying jobs, rock-bottom unemployment, and some of the lowest gas, food, and housing prices in the nation. Kitchen and bath product maker Kohler and food manufacturers Johnsonville and Sargento Foods are headquartered nearby, providing a steady stream of stable careers. The unemployment rate is 2.1%, the lowest in Michigan. Still, Sheboygan residents have one persistent gripe. As with elsewhere in the country, grocery prices have risen 25% in four years, driving much of their economic discontent. Even though inflation is coming down, prices are still up and people feel it. Stefano Vigiletti, who owns three area restaurants and a specialty Italian market with his wife, there's still a fair amount of angst about prices. People here aren't bazillionaires. They're working middle class. And when the price of eggs or milk goes up, they have to make adjustments for everything else. In interviews with more than three dozen shoppers at three stores, almost all cited high food prices as a major financial hurdle. 
you will not be surprised to learn that in all seven of the swing states, Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and we throw in North Carolina for the sake of argument, even though it leans Republican, it's technically a presidential swing state. In all of them, food prices have soared. I mean, y'all, I can tell you this from, from my own experience because I'm the one who does the shopping. I go with my wife's health. She doesn't like to go to grocery stores, particularly after COVID. I do the shopping. Now, I laugh and say I'm above average. One of the worst things to happen to us is a Publix opened. For those of you not in the Southeast, Publix, wonderful grocery store. Probably the best. And I go to Publix just about every day. There are some days I don't. Didn't go on Saturday. But I went on Sunday. I frequently go to the grocery store. And you know what? I can tell you firsthand that costs have gone up. I can tell you firsthand that things have gotten expensive. I can tell you firsthand just from my experience at the grocery store that it costs me more to buy the same amount of groceries than it did even a year ago. And the Democrats keep telling us, well, inflation's gone down, inflation's gone down. But inflation, that means we're not having deflation, we're just having lower inflation. So prices are still going up, they're just not going up as fast. And Joe Biden, you know, in the State of the Union, he called out snicker bars. The Mars Company is a great American institution. The Mars Company is headquartered in McLean, Virginia. It was founded in Tacoma, Washington. And it makes Mars bars, although those are much more popular overseas than here at home. The the Milky Way is the Mars bar here, which they also make. The Three Musketeer, M&M's, Skittles, Snickers, Twix, the Bounty Bar. It makes a lot of stuff. Oh, I didn't realize it makes uh, Pedigree and Whiskas and Neutro and Royal Canaan Foods. It makes Orbit Gum. Mars is an American institution. You'll notice they've moved to McLean, Virginia, right outside Washington, D.C., so, wow. Okay. So, I knew about the candy bars, but so Mars Food makes uh, Ben's Original, uh, Domeo, I don't know, Kind Bars, makes um, Distribute Seeds of Change, Tasty Bite. It has a bunch of healthcare foods and pet foods, lots of pet, my gosh, it has lots of pet foods globally. Pedigree, Neutro, My Dog, Spiller, Sheba. And then, of course, it makes the great candy bars. It makes the Three Musketeer bar I love, Dove chocolate bars. makes Flavia, Galaxy bars. I grew up with those in Dubai. M&M's, the Milky Way bar, Snickers bars, my favorite. I keep frozen Snicker bars in my freezer. makes Twix bar, and then it owns Wrigley gum now. It makes all the Wrigley gums. It's fantastic. Now, here's the thing, and this is why I bring it up. Because Joe Biden attacked Mars Corporation in his State of the Union address for shrinkflation, saying the Snicker bars are smaller now. It's not true. My buddy Scott Jennings, he's on CNN. He used to work for Mitch McConnell. He called the Mars Corporation. They said our Snicker bars are the same price or the same size that they've been. We're not reducing the size of sticker bars. That's what Joe Biden said. You will notice, you will notice that no one has called out Joe Biden in fact-checking. In fact, if anything, the media has been overly defensive for Joe Biden trying to blame corporations. Now, I need to explain this phenomenon to you. 
because there is actually something to shrinkflation. But let me explain how you, this works for you. And I'm going to use Chick-fil-A as the example because I, I, I know Chick-fil-A is an easy example here, but these businesses do this. Like uh, bounty paper towels, we get them, and they are smaller. The, the price hasn't changed, but the, the number is less. So Chick-fil-A tries to only raise its prices every few years. It doesn't raise its price constantly. And what it does is let's say it takes a, a sandwich, and I'm just I'm using made up numbers here just so you know because I'm dumb and, and I'm not good with math. So the price of something goes from five dollars to fifteen dollars. So now technically they're making ten dollars, except really what's happened is the cost of the good has gone up to ten dollars. They've jumped their price from five dollars to fifteen dollars. But the actual price of the product has gone up ten dollars, so they're still only they're only making five dollars in actual profit. You got me. So they're charging you fifteen dollars for something that was five dollars, but internally their cost has gone up to ten dollars. So now here's what Chick Fil A is going to do: is it's going to hold that fifteen dollar price if it can for five years. And this year it's making five dollars a profit. Well, next year the the price is going to go up to eleven dollars internally, their wholesale price. So now they're making four dollars, and then the next year the price is going to go up to twelve dollars. So now they're only making three dollars. So your big jump right now is a big jump, but their profit margin over the next few years is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and they're not going to keep raising prices on you. They're packing in the profits now and reducing profits over time until they have to make their next jump. It's what most manufacturers and, and, and producers of consumer goods do. So your bounty paper towel roll has shrunk, but they're charging you the same price. They know that you would go look for a competitor if they up the price. They could keep the package the same. Keep the same number of paper towels, but if they increase the price on you, you're going to go to to, to Brawny or, or some other manufacturer. You're going to go to the discount cheapy paper towels that don't actually work to save money. It's a way for them to still give you the product you want without jacking up prices. Yes, they've had to shrink a little bit to, to make ends meet, to to make their own profits. Profit isn't a bad thing. Profit is what keeps this country flowing economically. Profit is a good thing. Profit is a good thing. The Democrats can vilify profit because there aren't a lot of people who want to come out and defend profit. I will defend profit. It is a good thing in an arm's length transaction. A byproduct of profit keeps the arm's length transactions going, keeps the economy going. And the Democrats are vilifying that and attacking that and attacking the way these companies are trying to make money while also providing a good and service to you guys. They don't care about the fallout. They care about winning the election. And they're trying to find someone to blame because they don't want to take blame because it was their policies and they can't admit it. So they will attack corporate America. They will attack your small business. They will attack anyone and anything. They'll mischaracterize Donald Trump all to avoid ownership of the problem, which Joe Biden said he would do if he became president. He got elected and refuses to take on any blame for all the economic problems that he himself caused. You know, you can learn about the free market and profit by taking great classes at Hillsdale College. And right now they've got a great introductory class for you from uh, Victor Davis Hanson on citizenship and its decline and how we can revitalize it. Victor Davis Hanson, the award-winning military historian who cares deeply for this country. He's got a great series of lectures on citizenship, uh, where it comes from, what it means, why it's in decline, how it can be revitalized. It's completely free. All you do is go to Eric, E-R-I-C-K, ericforhillsdale.com. Ericforhillsdale.com. You start taking these classes from Hillsdale College, and you will see they have so much more on C.S. Lewis, on basic economics, on Milton Freeman. They have so many great classes. The Constitution one in particular is just, just wonderful. You go to ericforhillsdale.com. You begin your relationship with Hillsdale College, and you start learning today. So many of you want to listen to podcasts. Listen to these lectures from Hillsdale College instead because they are illuminating. They are not They are not in any way, shape, or form boring. They're very engaging. They're very fulfilling. They're very rewarding. They're very educational. And you learn so much, and they keep you entertained. Victor Davis Hanson is a great one to start with on citizenship. You go to ericforhillsdale.com, and you put in your email address. You can start learning and start living a meaningful educational existence with Hillsdale College today. Eric, E-R-I-C-K, ericforhillsdale.com. Go check them out today.
Buenos dias, world, from the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. I'm Marco Wint. And I'm Rick Schwartz. And we're your hosts for season three of Amazing Wildlife, a show from iHeartRadio Ruby Studio and the global conservation organization behind the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Listen as we dive into the efforts here in San Diego and spotlight the heroes working worldwide to care for the species you know and love. Listen to Amazing Wildlife on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hello there. Welcome. It's Eric Erickson here. I follow a a Twitter account called Car Dealership Guy, and he's got this fascinating um, report up. Cars have way more problems now. From 2020 to 2023, car owners have reported a 109% increase in problems with their cars within the first 90 days of ownership. And a lot of it has to do with the technology in new cars. That it's, we're so jam full of technology and, and that technology doesn't often work. I, I, I say this because over the weekend I saw somebody who commented on a, a VW bug, like a, an old school one from the 1980s, and how the it's so easy to fix because there really aren't a bunch of electronic parts in it, and that modern cars are so uh, com- such giant mobile computers, it's harder and harder to fix and more and more expensive and causing problems. And I, I, I really do wonder if it is at all possible for a car manufacturer to make a really cheap car that is mostly mechanical, mostly analog, not digital, that works for people, could keep prices down because people are being priced out of the car market. And at the same time, I think, you know, government regulations mandate now so many things in cars. Part of the reason cars have become so technological is because the government mandates, uh, whether it's rear view cameras or airbags or you name it. I'm not saying that, that these aren't good things, although there's, there's contradictory evidence on airbags. But is it at all possible, like another example, is your appliances in your house. I don't need an internet-connected refrigerator. I, I really, trust me, I have no reason for my internet to be, or my refrigerator to be connected to the internet or to have a television in it. I'm not standing in front of the refrigerator eating out of it while I watch TV. And yet, these are the appliances being manufactured by so many manufacturers, and then they break so much easier than just an old-school dishwasher or... A uh, washing machine or refrigerator. It seems like there's a market out there for some company to come out with the least technologically advanced places. I know my wife would love them. Good Lord, my wife hates technology, y'all. If my wife could take a, a stone tablet and a chisel and use that as a computer and just chisel out what she wants on it, I think she would be happy. This is a woman who smashed an iPhone with a meat cleaver because she was mad at it. Uh, she does not like technology. But also, technology is more and more prone to break and drive up costs on people. And cars are one of the chief utilitarian functional devices we use, and the technological ones are so – I mean, then you get the EMP. If the the Newt Gingrich-feared EMP ever comes, everybody with an electronic device is going to be SOL, except for the people who have the old-school cars, like in Cuba, that don't have any electronics in them. A world where the Cubans suddenly survive because the electromagnetic pulse doesn't take out their 1956 Chevys they're still driving. It's really remarkable. I I just think the technological landscape is we're on the verge of, I think, a backlash against all the the super fancy everything connected to the Internet. Uh, China can hack it. It just it doesn't make sense to me. It's deeply frustrating to me. And as somebody who has seen the cost of these appliances and stuff go up, like I, we've got one of those pebble ice makers from General Electric. It's Wi-Fi connected. I don't know why it's Wi-Fi connected. I've refused to connect it to Wi-Fi because I see no use in it. And yet I couldn't find one that wasn't connected to Wi-Fi. And I don't want China hacking it one day, so it's just not connected to Wi-Fi. I don't understand why these manufacturers just can't make the simplest device. And they say it's consumers. No, I assure you, there are a lot of consumers who do not want a Wi-Fi enabled refrigerator it makes no sense, and it just charge, it racks up the cost. Give me a basic refrigerator that's going to last me 50 years, like my parents could one time buy. Buenos dias, world, from the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. I'm Marco Wint. And I'm Rick Schwartz. And we're your hosts for Season 3 of Amazing Wildlife, a show from iHeartRadio Ruby Studio and the global conservation organization behind the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. 
Listen as we dive into the efforts here in San Diego and spotlight the heroes working worldwide to care for the species you know and love. Listen to Amazing Wildlife on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.